We've briefly mentioned the Drake Equation on this channel a few times, but we haven't ever taken an in-depth look at the equation and what exactly it means for the search for extraterrestrial life. So today we're going to be looking at exactly what the Drake Equation is, why it was created, and the main arguments both in favour and against it. The Equation the Drake Equation was created by, wait for it, a scientist named Drake. What? In 1961, Frank Drake was one of a small group who took part in the Green Bank Conference, a conference held at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory's Green Bank Observatory. It was an informal meeting that was designed to try and quantify what odds the search for extraterrestrial life or SETI had of ever actually detecting something. A few days before the conference began, Drake began identifying the key details they would need to attempt to estimate in order to come up with an approximate answer for SETI. And when the conference began, he went to the chalkboard and wrote down this equation that we're showing on the screen right now. N was meant to signify the number of extraterrestrial civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy that were actively trying to communicate with other civilizations, and the hope was that N would be large enough to justify SETI's existence. The goal wasn't to come up with an exact number, just an approximation to determine the feasibility and merit of the project. It was supposed to be a springboard for discussion more than anything else, but it's over 60 years later and we're still talking about the Drake equation, so clearly Drake underestimated what he had created. So, to calculate the number of civilizations, we have to multiply all the other terms together. R is defined as the average rate of star formation in our galaxy. F sub P is the fraction of those stars that have planets. N sub E is the average number of planets that could support life each star that had planets. F sub 1 is the fraction of those habitable planets that would actually see life develop. F sub I is the fraction of those planets that would develop intelligent life. F sub C is the fraction of those civilizations that would develop the technology capable of releasing detectable signals out into the universe. And finally, L was the length of time that those civilizations would be broadcasting detectable signals. Now, there is a lot of debate over the proper values for each of those terms and heavy criticism over the analysis of the equation. However, interestingly enough, there is very little debate over the equation itself. Some would argue that it's too simplistic, but that the general premise seems sound. If we somehow knew all of those valuables, we should be able to make a pretty good calculation, but we obviously don't know them for sure. At the Green Bank Conference, they set forth to come up with their best estimates for each of the values. Some of the numbers they agreed upon we now know are factually incorrect, and others will charitably call optimistic. In 1961, this collection of esteemed scientists estimated that in the billions of years since it formed, an average of one star formed each year in the Milky Way galaxy. Next, they guessed that anywhere from 20% to 50% of all stars formed would have planets. Of those that did, they agreed that each of those stars would have from one to five planets capable of supporting life. And here is where things get exceedingly optimistic. Of the planets that were capable of life, they estimated that 100 percent of them would develop life. They also agreed that 100% would go on to develop intelligent life. Now, they did rein in their optimism a bit and guessed that only 10 to 20% of those intelligent civilizations would currently be actively communicating. And finally, there is the matter of L, the length of time over which a civilization would communicate. This seemed to be the most contentious topic, and it resulted in a much higher level of variance than the other values. Their proposed value of L was somewhere between 1,000 and 100 million years. If we take the minimum of each of those values, we get that n equals 20, or there should be 20 other intelligent civilizations in the galaxy that are actively trying to communicate. If we take the maximum of each of those values, we get n equals 50 million. Drake ultimately concluded that the value of n was roughly equivalent to the value of L. Considering half of the other values just represented multiplication by one and the other half could potentially cancel each other out, that's not really a surprising conclusion. At the end of the conference, the scientists had some champagne to celebrate their efforts in determining that there were somewhere between 20 and 50 million other civilizations in our galaxy, as if that range is in any way useful. The director of the Green Bank Observatory made a toast. So the value of L may have proved to be a very large number. Now, it's a heartwarming story that helped keep SETI funded, but the story was supposed to end there. When Drake wrote down his famous equation, he was just trying to identify the parameters they needed to discuss at the conference. After those three days were over, he didn't think anyone else would ever see it. Boy, was he ever wrong. Current estimates. 
As we said, most critics of the Drake equation don't have much of an issue with the equation itself. The issue is in the highly speculative nature of many of those variables. A lot of research and effort has been put into trying to find better values for these numbers, and we have some new estimates that tell a slightly different story. First is the value of R, the average number of stars formed each year. The Green Bank Conference was guessing at this, and they felt that one per year was a pretty conservative estimate. Thanks to calculations from NASA and the European Space Agency in 2010, we now know that they they were indeed a bit conservative. The actual value of R is between 1.5 and 3. They weren't way off, but this would actually increase the value of N, so it's a step in favor of aliens within our galaxy. Next is F sub P, the number of stars that have planets. While the conference thought that only half of stars or fewer had planets orbiting them, this has again been shown to be false. Analysis performed in 2012 shows that this value may be 100% or close enough to it for the difference to be negligible. So far, we've increased the value of n by a factor of 15, so that's pretty good news for those of us who are hoping to make contact with extraterrestrials within our lifetime. So now it's obviously time for things to go really downhill. N sub e, the number of habitable planets orbiting each star, was estimated at 1 to 5. This was extremely optimistic. According to a 2013 report based on data from the Kepler space mission, there are potentially 40 billion Earth-sized planets orbiting the habitable zones around sun-like stars or red dwarf stars, which may be equally habitable to a planet orbiting a sun-like star. With an estimated 100 billion planets in the galaxy, that means that the value would only be 0.4 planets per star. This is also a very simplified analysis of things, as we'll get into a little bit later. Now we get to one of the most contentious variables in the equation, F sub 1, the fraction of habitable planets where life actually forms. This is hard to guess, because we have a sample size of one, Earth. This one sample wasn't even chosen at random, because it's the planet that we already live on. Surprise! Without ever finding life on other planets, or finding that other planets are devoid of life, there's no way for us to know one way or the other. However, the argument comes down to abiogenesis, the creation of life from non-living matter. Even if Earth is our only sample size, there are arguments in favor of this both being inevitable and extremely rare. Suggesting that abiogenesis is common is the fact that life on Earth began pretty much the moment the conditions on the planet became favorable for life. On the other hand, as far as we can tell, the process only ever happened once. The thing with evolution is that all life is related to one another. But if abiogenesis took place multiple times on Earth, then this shouldn't necessarily be the case. We can see that the jump from single-celled organisms to multicellular organisms seems to have happened at least 20 times, but we have never found any bacteria on Earth that aren't related to one another. It's a reasonable argument, but it isn't a smoking gun. It is possible that abiogenesis happened multiple times, but one branch of life just beat out the others in the battle of survival for the fittest. Or an entire branch could have been eliminated in one of Earth's mass extinction events. There may be no evidence that abiogenesis happened more than once, but there isn't proof that it didn't either. Equally contentious is F sub i, the fraction of previous planets that develop intelligent life. Once again, we're working with a sample size of one, which makes this very difficult. In 2020, a study was published using Bayesian analysis to try to better quantify this variable. The conclusion was that there are favorable odds for the formation of intelligent life with only one major caveat. The study would only apply to a planet with identical conditions to Earth. Even then, the authors weren't super confident in the results. Arguing against intelligent life being inevitable is the fact that intelligent life only developed on Earth one time. In 3.7 billion years of life on the planet, intelligent life has only existed for a couple of million years, and the odds of it happening were potentially very low. When it comes to the final two variables, how many civilizations will broadcast their presence and for how long, there is literally nothing we can do except make a wild ass guess. We did it! But does that mean everyone would? There are some pretty good arguments why civilizations would want to hide from extraterrestrials that could encounter them. As for how long they would broadcast, that's even harder to guess since we don't know how long we will do it. Will we solve all of humanity's problems and venture out into the stars broadcasting our existence for millions of years? Or is self-destruction by climate change, nuclear war, or some other disaster all but inevitable for any space-faring civilization? With only a single incomplete data point, there's no real way to know. 
Using these new values, both pessimistic and optimistic, we once again get a huge range of values for n. The high end is over 15 million, which is still a significant decrease now that we have burn numbers for the first three variables. However, the low end is now about 10 to the power of minus 12, which is effectively zero. It would mean we are forever alone. Arguments for and against. The arguments on either side can be boiled down to one key principle each. In favor of the optimistic values of the Drake equation is the mediocrity principle. This idea states that even if an item is drawn at random from some set or group of sets, whatever is chosen is most likely to be an average example. Basically, if you have a bag with 99 black marbles and one white one, if you randomly chose a marble, it will probably be black. As such, we should assume that Earth is just an average planet and the values pertaining to life, intelligent life, and communicative life all should be 100%. But as we said before, the selection wasn't really random. We chose Earth as the sample size because it's where we live. And this all brings us to the rare Earth hypothesis. This is the suggestion that a planet like Earth is extremely rare and there are far more variables than the Drake equation takes into account. The equation looks at Earth-sized planets orbiting Sun-like stars. But is that really enough? In addition to those requirements, we need to be in the right kind of galaxy, one with lots of metal. Jupiter-like gas giants have been found in the habitable zone around stars, but those planets would not be habitable. Having a large moon may also be important, as the moon helps prevent the Earth's rotation from changing that much. The right angle of tilt is important as well. Earth's axis is tilted 23.5 degrees. If it was tilted too much, the seasons would become too extreme. If it wasn't tilted enough, the area around the equator would be too hot, and the areas away from the equator would be too cold. Our planet's plate tectonics also play a large role, as does the Earth's core. The rotations of the solid inner core and the liquid outer core combine to create the magnetosphere, helping to trap the thick atmosphere that's also a requirement. There are more specifications, but it seems certain that this would all bring the number of habitable planets down quite a bit from just counting those that are the right size. The argument against all of these additional restrictions is that there's no guarantee that any of those things are either rare or necessary. And that's it. That's, that's actually the whole counter-argument. Wrap up. When Drake first wrote down his equation in 1961, he just wanted to have a conversation with other scientists about the basic parameters required for communicative, intelligent life. Since SETI wasn't government funded, they may have been extra motivated to come up with an answer that would appeal to investors, but that was pretty much the end of his plan. It was never intended to become the subject of intense debate for decades. Though research has been able to give us firm numbers for half the variables, the other half remain entirely conjecture. Unfortunately, it's unlikely that that's going to change within our lifetimes. The nearest habitable planet is four light years away, so uh, we can't just send a probe there to grab some samples and look for bacteria. So how many extraterrestrial civilizations are there within the Milky Way galaxy that are trying to communicate with us right now? Well, thanks to the Drake equation, we could say with a high level of certainty that the answer is definitely somewhere from zero to 50 million. It's a pretty big range, but... I mean, we answered the question.